Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk, Archive as Library, Meditations and Actions. Language documentation has been described as the creation of a lasting, multi-purpose record of a language. These acts of creation and preservation remain the central concern of documentary linguistics to present, as can be seen in the way language documentation is taught, as well as the ways in which language documentation is funded. What, however, should be done with these language documentations that have been created? One path forward is to reimagine the documentary archive as a library, which is what is proposed in this talk. With the archive reconceived as a library, um, three documentary deposits familiar to myself, uh, Harvey 2017, Harvey 2019, and Griscom and Harvey 2020, and their community contexts, that is, the Gorwa, Ihanzu, and Hadza community contexts, will be examined using Ranganathan's 1931 Five Laws of Library Science. This exercise is used to generate ideas as well as to frame existing or actionable practices with the aim of sharing current practices, encouraging imaginative visions of the future, and resisting claims of the creation of quote-unquote data graveyards. To start, I'm a linguist, and I've been doing language documentation in an area of north-central Tanzania we often call the Tanzanian Rift since around 2012. Since then, I've been involved in the creation of documentary collections for three language communities, Gorwa, Ihanzu, and Hadza. Each of these have archive deposits associated with them with the Endangered Languages Archive, or ELAR for short. In 2006, Nicholas Himmelmann wrote an important and oft-quoted contribution, defining a language documentation as a lasting, multi-purpose record of a language. Even before this point, but certainly after it, a number of organizations around the world have made it their purpose to house, protect, and preserve these language documentations, the language archives, including the ones on screen. However, in the world of language documentation, the focus has primarily been on the creation and preservation of language documentations, rather than in their use once they have been created. Um, this is evident in both how language documentation is taught, as well as in how it is funded. So, in Bauer in 2015, for example, there are three pages of a total of 230 dedicated to archiving. In Sackle and Everett, uh, 2012, around two pages of 170 mention archiving, though it does also hint at how archiving can be linked to helping the community. Meekins, Green, and Turpin, 2018, dedicate 10 pages out of a total of 320 and develop a concept of bush potato that I find useful and will briefly return to later on. As I mentioned, the predominance of creating the documentation over using the documentation is also evident in funding. So funding schemes will primarily fund only the collection of materials and the creation of archival collections. Consideration of how these collections will be used is given rather less or even no consideration or support. Though perhaps this is changing, a recent scan seems to show that the Foundation for Endangered Languages, as well as the Endangered Language Fund, may fund the kinds of things I'll be focusing on today. But the central question still remains, once they are created, what is to be done with language archives? Note that the foundational literature is vague on who the ultimate audience is for archival deposits. This is due to one a sort of sense of high inclusivity. Ideally, the language documentation is usable by as many potential groups as possible. And two, the unknowableness of the future. That is, we simply cannot know how these materials will be used throughout their purposely long lifetimes. It leaves a lot up to our imaginations. And because we're trying to be more concrete here, my focus in this talk will be on the language community as the principal audience, though this exercise could be carried out with other um, target audiences in mind as well, say, for example, uh, linguistic researchers.
I would also like to adopt the bush potato metaphor developed for archives in Meekins, Green, and Turpin 2018. In this conceptualization, larger, well-resourced archives act as the major repository for collections of linguistic data, and at the same time create and foster smaller archives or local access systems. Continuing this metaphor, when harvesting the bush potato for food, if one were to dig up the mother potato, some of the offshoots would die. But conversely, the offshoot potatoes can be harvested readily without harming the mother potato. As such, today we'll be talking about both major repositories as well as possibly offshoot repositories, working through the entire potato patch, if you will. Perhaps a worst case metaphor for any archive is archive as cemetery, a metaphor popularized by Newman in a famous or infamous 2013 talk in which he described a scenario in which a documentary linguist were to collect a massive amount of natural speech data, and then that data were to sit in a repository unanalyzed and unused until the end of time. Though there have been several convincing critical responses to this metaphor down the intervening years, especially in terms of its ultimate applicability, the fate of a language archive to be static and unused is still worth considering, even as a provocation to ensure that this not come to pass. But today I want to focus on a best case scenario. Today I want to explore this via the library metaphor. What if we imagined the archive as a library? Today, we will carry this out by taking S. R. Ranganathan's Five Laws of Library Science, an early seminal work in library studies, and apply it to digital language archives. The specific archives and the specific community contexts we will draw upon are the three language documentations with which I am most familiar, that is, the Gorwa, Ihanzu, and Hadza archive deposits on Ilar, as well as the language communities from which they come. Let us start with Ranganathan's first law of library science, that books are for use. This could be transposed to the archive as archived resources are for use. We can imagine a long list of things that this statement would entail, but here I'll focus on three the imperative of open access, the importance of making resources which will be relevant to the users, as well as the challenge of situating the archive among its users. We'll start with open access, and ensuring that as many recordings as ethically possible are openly accessible in an archive being a benefit to the usability of the archive resources is fundamental. There is less of a squeamishness about doing this now than in the past, but it still should be mentioned at the outset. This is an example from my friend and colleague Richard Griscom's archival deposit of Azamjeg de Toga resources. Another factor to keep in mind when attempting to make archived resources maximally use usable is to make resources which will be relevant to the users. This may again sound rather self-evident, but it's important to mention as this process may begin even before the language documentation itself begins. Because we're focusing on the local community as the target users in this talk, the question is then, what kinds of recordings will be meaningful and appropriate for members of the language community, both today as well as in the foreseeable future? In my experience, there are several ways in which this question can be approached. In the context of the Gorwa documentation, early on, this took the form of holding a community meeting and getting people to talk about the kinds of things they'd like to see in a documentary collection. For a period of several years, I tried involving a local group of Gorwa elders as an advisory committee to help me decide. In the end, however, it was the reorientation of the project to one in which community members themselves went out and did the majority of the recordings and made the majority of the decisions on what it was they were going to record that really resulted in the kind of material that was interesting and relevant to local people. This was, in fact, the primary approach of both the Ihanzu as well as the Hadza documentation projects from the outset. And the image on screen is of Hadza local researchers Angela Sampson and Nange Chaka setting up recording equipment. For those of us interested in learning more about a local researcher approach, as well as to hear some of the reflections from the Gorwa local researchers, I encourage you to listen to a talk I gave earlier this year, which can be accessed by the QR code on screen. <laughs> 
The final observation may seem superfluous. After all, since the material is online, haven't we moved beyond the need for physical spaces? Um, in my context, one in which internet access is still the preserve of those who can afford the relatively expensive rates, the answer is emphatically no. So how can the archive be brought to its users? There are as many answers here as there are contexts, several which are being considered in the ones in which I work. So one is situating desktop computers whose hard drives have been filled with resources in places like schools, community centers, and other locations. This is called the jukebox archive approach um, that was written about by Omera and uh, Guadarrama, and that's in the references. Um, another approach would be widely distributing SD cards with resources to community members such that they can be accessed on the feature phones still widely used across the area. And a third approach could be allowing local media vendors to become librarians, if you will. I'd like to expand on this, and the image we are currently looking at is Singida Town Stand. Now, this is a particularly modern example of a bus stand in Tanzania, but the principle applies to all, uh, or virtually all, bus stands, from the smallest communities up to the biggest cities. In these buildings around the bus stand, some will sell tickets, some will sell food for travelers, while others invariably will have a young man inside, and it's almost always a young man, who, can give, who you can give your memory card to, and for a small fee, will fill that memory card with music, speeches, and videos. While this media is currently primarily Swahili language material, what if these media workers had access to and a knowledge of the resources available in, say, the Ihanzu language? The second law of library science is every person his or her book. This is essentially a call for equal rights of access for every potential reader. I'll translate this to the archive as Archived resources must be radically inclusive, and by this I specifically mean that if the archive is made with the local community in mind, it must be made for every member of the community in mind. Uh, this not only must include gender, age, and physical location, but also factors such as their familiarity with digital materials, as well as their fluency in both the, the resource language as well as the archive meta-language. Uh, two corollaries of the second law that I'll mention here are metadata and education programs for the archive's use. Starting with metadata, having enough of it for each resource and having it in a form that is immediately comprehensible to a potential user is important. I'll be the first person to admit that it's not sufficient, but just having a phrase or two in Swahili describing what the recordings contain in the archival deposit is a start. Going further, however, educating users and potential users on how to go about finding archived resources is another important possibility. As most uh, university libraries now have specific inductions for newcomers on how to use their facilities, archive collections could benefit from the same. Imagine, if you will, a way in which members of the language community could receive training on how to use the archive. Perhaps this could be an annual seminar, or maybe a set of easily accessible online explainers, or perhaps a community member whose job it is to help interested individuals use and explore the archive. The third law of library science is in many ways the converse of the second, where the second focuses on the reader, the third law, every book for its reader, essentially centers the book. Transposed to the archive, it might read, archived resources must be advocated for. By this, I mean we should aim for a situation in which each resource is given the chance to be discovered and used by potential users. We need, in a sense, to encourage the use of every recording. Two possible corollaries of this law are the need for publicity and the need for extension services. In preparing this talk, I tried to give one action that has been put into place already, but for this law, both of these are only ideas for now. Uh, so starting with publicity, this is an actionable kind of start. Where a large and well-funded library may have regular updates on their new acquisitions, such as this blog post on recent acquisitions at the SOAS Library's African Studies Collection, perhaps an archive could make the effort to blog or post on social media about its individual resources, new translations, or other information that would bring materials to wider recognition. 
For a library, extension services refer to all the activities that turn non-readers into readers, that inform people of all the library services, and that transform the library into a community center. To properly cover the list of things one could do here would require another dedicated presentation, but some of what could be included is represented here, including discussion groups where community members come together and talk about a particular resource or set of related resources, listening parties in which resources are played for the enjoyment of a gathering of people, and, for example, an annual bulletin describing for the community what has been going on at the archive. The fourth law of library science is about efficiency. Save the time of the reader. Transposing this to the archive is pretty straightforward, and we can simply state it as save the time of the user. This would be associated with creating user guides to the archived resources and services to help the user quickly access the resources they are looking for. One example would be a rich tagging system for resources, like the ones that can be developed for deposits within the ELAR archive. Within the set of tags in the Hadza deposit, for example, is a set listing the names of towns, villages, and camps. By selecting any of these, all of the recordings made in that place will appear on a list. The fifth and final law of library science is that a library is a growing organism. The same can be applied to the archive. Three corollaries of this are balanced growth, renewal and change, and commitment to people. The first of these is an explicit recognition of the fact that an archive can and should grow. This can be both in terms of including new resources, but also including new data about existing resources. For example, in 2019, approximately 16% of recorded materials in the Gorwad deposit had uh, corresponding transcriptions and Swahili translations. That's around 270 individual recordings of the total at the time. Whereas now in 2024, approximately 28% of, re of recorded materials in the Gorwad deposit had corresponding transcriptions and Swahili translations. That's around 850 individual recordings. So not only is a larger proportion of the pie a darker color in 2024, but we should imagine the actual pie in 2024 is considerably larger as well. Much of this new material corresponds to recordings made by the Gorwa local researchers themselves during language documentation in 2018 and 2019. This is talked about more in depth in the talk, which can be accessed via the QR code on screen. The point here is, is that from its original creation, the archive deposit has grown and changed in important ways and will continue to do so as it is enriched, especially by materials such as translations, transcriptions, and annotations, which render its original content more accessible and richer. A second corollary of the archive as a growing organism is the dynamic of renewal and change. One can compare the Hadza material Bonnie Sands archive with UCLA Phonetics Lab, which to my understanding was last updated in 2009, and legacy materials she archived as part of the ELAR deposit in 2022, an archive which is still actively updated. Technologically, a great deal has changed in that decade or more between these two archiving events. The ability to store large amounts of audiovisual material, the quality of that audiovisual material itself, as well as the global accessibility of such materials. What, I wonder, will be the changes of the next 10 to 15 years, and how will they force the archive uh, to change over that span of time. I'm not a futurist, but these are additional questions that we must ask and be prepared to respond to. Finally, uh, through recognizing the archive as a growing organism, attention must turn to people, because as much as the archive is a data object, it is also, and should also be seen as, a social object. Many elements associated with this were mentioned throughout the talk, but I'll leave us with a final vision. This is a map representing each of the archive deposits currently part of the ELAR archive. Imagine a world in which every single one of these deposits has a dedicated person or a team of people whose sole job it was to care for and develop it along the lines of the ideas we've discussed today and to find ways in which to make it available to and alive for the community from which it comes. This may sound fanciful today, but if the archive is a library, then they must have their librarians.
In conclusion, then, this talk was an exercise in reframing, in looking at the digital language archive deposit as a library and applying to it some foundational principles of library science. Using the three digital language archive deposits with which I'm most familiar, not only did we re review some current practices, but we allowed ourselves to be imaginative and created some space for what could be in the future. The title of today's colloquium is Bringing Archives to Life. It is my hope that this contribution gave some room to exploring that potential and moves us a little further along toward that goal. Finally, I would like to thank my friend and colleague Richard Griscom for some of the media used in this talk. Raheli Lawi, Emmanuel Marco, Dira Michai, and Agustino Amos Caguema all appear in images in this talk, and I would like to acknowledge them for that. Thanks are also due to Pascal Bu, Stefano Edward, Christina Guay, Festo Masani, Samuel Isia, Sara Calayel, Mariamu Anyawire, Bunga Paolo, Endeko Simon, Nange Chaka, Angela Sampson, Jacobo Lubumba, and Elizabeth Minja, the local researchers who took part in the respective Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu language documentation projects. Also, I would like to thank all the Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu people who contributed their time and knowledge to the language documentation projects. The beautiful image of the Muyinga Library in Burundi, which bookended this talk, was used by permission granted by BC Architects and Studies. And finally, thanks to Alba Hermida Rodriguez, Saskia Dunn, and Nina van der Vlucht for inviting me to speak at this colloquium. I've learned a lot from my time here and hope that my, contrib my contribution uh, added something as well. So thank you, and here are my references.